over here is uh, Zeno 2. Uh, something else about this one, but it's of the network systems. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and I really want to use the opportunity to thank Ruth <coughs> and Jeremy to put this such a nice conference. I enjoy it. Um, unfortunately, I have missed yesterday because I was teaching two courses back to back, and, but I was able to come back <laughs> and enjoy the conference today. I also want to use the opportunity to thank Professor Yao for providing the venue to host this conference. And I'm a statistician, so what I'm going to talk about will be something more on the student side. More, precise, you know, more precisely, I'm going to talk about how to do the inference about dynamic systems, mostly by all ODEs, but also by deep, delay different equations. So this will be some complementary, because it's complementary to what the previous speaker talked about. And this is based on joint work with two former PG students, Samuel Wang, who is right now an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo, and Shi Hao Yang, who will start uh, in the upcoming year as assistant professor at the Georgia Tech. And so dynamic system, for this audience, I don't have to motivate too much about dynamic systems. Basically, we have, we have a, in most, my, my very often, we have a dealing with systems that de de defined through interacting systems, for example, through ODEs. Here's the classical model, so-called Afton model, that describes the, um, describes the spike potentials of neuron. And this itself is clean enough to, to write down equations in two lines. And this model itself is a widely studied in OD literature and so on. And in itself, it's a simplified model from the famous Hodgkin Huxley model, which got the Nobel Prize in 1963. And so in this case, clearly, the trick here is that we're dealing with non-linear non systems. Therefore, we, in most cases, we don't have closed one expression. Then how do we do inference? In this case, for example, this is a simple, clean enough case, so that later I can draw a lot of pictures. And so A, B, C can be become clear. But can you imagine, if you are talking about chemical reaction network, you're probably dealing with 20 components interacting with each other. In terms of the parameters, you're talking about tens of parameters, <coughs> even hundreds of parameters. Regression, for example, there will be, could be regression coefficient, or uh, there could be bonding affinity, there could be conversion rate, or uh, could be binding rate, and so on. So that's all sorts of parameters can occur in this situation. And here's another example, and which makes also come from toy, sort of toy version of uh, single gene, uh, single gene feedback. So chances are, in our cell, uh, there's a feedback loop through through transpiration factor. For example, this is an example, this is an illustration of one single gene feedback network. So too much expression of a particular protein, chances are will lead the cell to reduce the production in the future. Otherwise, the, the protein might be saturated, that reducing, really leading to damage of the cell and so on. So this will come with a concrete example of how to, just for this single protein, if we, we use P to model the protein concentration, and M to model M messenger RNA concentration, this there will be some, a very simple system to describe how the protein concentration and messenger RNA concentration interact with each other. For example, V is the translation rate, C is the degradation of a protein, and A is the degradation of messenger RNA, and in this case, particularly we have this so called QE coefficient that affects how the protein concentrates. Effectively, too much proteins will shut down the uh, translation of messenger RNA through translation factor. That's one, uh, one simple example. But in real cells, things are more complicated. For example, it is well known that from the time and the transcription factor starts at to the time the mature M messenger appears in cytoplasma, that's a delay. If you really want to put a realistic situation to model this, then you goes beyond the ODE system. Now you talk about delay different equations. In addition, you have a delay factor tau, which is something you also estimate. You either plug in from an experiment operation, for example, five minutes, 10 minutes, that's what you do through experiments, or that if you want to estimate from the data, that become an additional parameter. And this becomes even more complicated because ODE, so I mean, delay different equation you not only need the initial condition, you also need everything you know up to time top, otherwise the system will not be programmed. So this becomes even more complicated if you want to use numerical approaches to address the issue. This, okay, this is not working. And as I mentioned, things will become more complicated, and typically it's not a case that the gene vector itself, but rather you're talking about network. 
gene A regular to gene B, gamma up, and B in turn regular C, C in turn regular D, and D come back regular to A, and so on. So this is a concrete example taken from Nature paper in 2000. This is one of the first examples where we have an artificially created sort of simple genome where you clearly see in the experiment, you see oscillations of the three genes. So for example, uh, black eye, uh, down, -reg down regular tab R and which down regular lambda CI and so on. So that's an interaction system. And in this particular case, if you want to use a different temperature model, this, at least now you're going to talk about six different six individual components for each of the proteins, their protein concentration and messenger RNA concentration. So simply the parameters A, B, for each individual one, you have A, I, B, I, C, I, and so on. So things become more complicated. And here, each was <coughs> reading this equation through pairs. So each one regular the J regular the I, J regular the I, U. This is cyclical system. And in this talk, our focus is to inference about all such a system, either ODE system or more, uh, ODE system or delayed differential system. In, in principle, what I described about can also be described, applied to stochastic system. For example, a PD, a SDE, stochastic differential equation. But for the time being, we haven't did that systematic invitation for stochastic differential system. So I will bring my talk in this case on ODE system or DDE system, delayed differential systems. So this is, here we're talking about inference. In a typical situation, you observe, you have concrete, you collect observations through either three experiments, for example, from microscopic image, microscopic image or through observations. For example, if you're studying ecology, you, you collect what the ants doing and so on. And or if you study epidemiology, you collect what is come, what the rate of people getting sick, for example, for flu and so on. Then you have discrete, typically you have discrete time, time observations and sometimes it's noisy, the noisy observation. And also it's very typical in this type of inference problems. Out of 20 components, or out of five components, maybe you only get a chance of the five, two of them. For example, in the, in the lab experiment, biology experiment, typically maybe you can only use fluorescent tagging to study, you attach two different colors. But out of the five species, you only observe two of them fluctuating over time. Then that's a, that's a basically problem. Sparse observations and noisy observations, that is actually the problem underlying this type of thing. And here's some concrete notation. We'll assume if the ice component is observed at time tj, then we, uh, let's assume we have a Gaussian noise with constant variance sigma squared. <coughs> and this is not a crucial assumption. The crucial assumption is that you know what this form of noise is. For example, the noise can depend on your y, x in some parametric way, that's fine. But this is not a crucial assumption, but crucial assumption that you know what this, what this is, what this form is. And then now let's, let's think about, let's do the inference. So here's, a, again, a concrete example, using the FA model as its ratio. As in FA model, I have two components, x1 and x2. Previously, I used V and R to denote two components. So this will be illustration of what you would encounter in, in reality. The black curve, the black dots are what you, what you observe for the first component, x1. The red dots are what you observe for the second component, x2. So we observe as discrete time points. For example, in this picture, I think 40 time points. And we'll observe with noise. We don't know the noise level. Sigma score itself is also from, also from that you want to address. And we want to do inference. We want to underestimate A, B, C. More, and more importantly, in addition to estimate A, B, C, we also put the uncertainty from the patient. That how accurate I'll see it. In, in other words, I, I attach an arrow bar in addition to your point estimate. So this is set up. And for, for this type of inference problem, actually, that occurs essentially as one of the fundamental tools, with one fundamental steps, when you want to apply a differential equation system or delay differential equation system to describe situation. Because typically, when you use the way you use dynamic system to describe system, there are several things you want to do it. First, you want to describe a system to have a conceptual understanding. Next, you want to do quantitative studies of the system. For example, estimating the reaction rate, estimating the binding rate, that's the third thing. The second thing, first thing you want to do predictions using the dynamic system. For example, what happens in the future, 10, 10 hours from now, what you expect the system to behave. So there are the three essential fundamental tasks you want to use once you apply dynamic systems models to describe well, uh, scientific phenomena, but in each of the steps, essentially, 
parameter estimation is unavoidable. If you want to really have a quantitative description, you have to know what are the parameters are, and you don't know how accurate your parameters are. Even in case you are not sure about the model, you want to know, given the current model cap capability, what is fast feeding I can explain, I can, I can explain from the data. So in either case, that's the reason why I want to do statistical inference. And in terms of the existing solutions, and the obvious one is to a non-linearly square, uh, non-linear MLE. And which is, in, in a nutshell, which is eventually goes on like this. Let's, for different possible trials of the parameter theta, A, B, C, for example, let's use a numerical software to try to, to populate the entire curve. And then we'll calculate the least mean square, uh, least square distance from my observations to your, high, to your numerical solution. And then I try to find the combination of A, B, C, such that sum of square error is minimized. That's essentially the brute force, the most straightforward way to think about this problem and to think uh, to study this. And there are other approaches, uh, you are realizing smoothing spines, and there are also in the literature ad hoc Bayesian approach. The reason I call it ad hoc is actually it is tricky to really write down the thing in you know, a principle of Bayesian way. Really make things, make everything make real sense to connect with what Bayesian studies is talking about. So here's the example, what I mean by brute force optimization. So brute force optimization will be, again, we find combinations A, B, C, such that, and e, such that if you do the numerical solver, you get a concrete curve, you calculate the least square, total, uh, total, least square, uh, total square distance from the observation to the curve, you minimize A, B, C. So here's a common example. In terms of ODEs, in addition to the A, B, C, in addition to parameter values, we also need to specify initial value so that at least the numerical solver can propagate. But that is unknown in practice. Nobody tells you where the system starts. So that's another unknown parameter. What we call nuisance parameter. You don't care. Turns out you don't care where it starts, but you it affect what the result is. So let's see, suppose you want to do brute force optimization. Then what do you do with that? Put some two initial put your initial gas of A, B, C and initial conditions. Let's propagate through using the numerical solver. And this is a, will be what numerical solver toward the end, uh, toward the end will tell you, given this ABC, given this combination of data and individual condition, this is what I care will look like. And then what you do, as I mentioned, you simply calculate the distance from what you, your actual operation to the numerical curves, and then you calculate least square. Thus, but you want to find a combination of ABC and x1, 0, x2, 0, such that this one is minimized. That is actually a nonlinear least square, the classical nonlinear least square approach. But in this approach, it's OK. For this system, we have three parameters. And you do it uh, iteratively, for example, use the Newton Robson, or use gradient uh, descent. You, want, you do it a few iterations, probably 10 iterations, iterations, probably you can find the minimizer. But you can imagine, if your system is 20 by 20, where you have 50 parameters, how many iterations you have to go through? Each time, numerical solver takes a lot of time to, do, to, the, to, to go through. So in principle, it's OK. But in, in reality, as long as the system gets reasonably large, this becomes a very, very time-consuming effect. And your computer has to run for a long, long time. So that's basically the drawback of this nonlinear MLE or nonlinear least work approach. OK? And now what we're going to do, we're going to apply a Bayesian approach. In a Bayesian approach, uh, we have uncertainty. We use a prior distribution to describe the uncertainty. You know, in this case, our uncertainty is not only about parameter factor theta, but also the uncertainty is about curves. So therefore, we, use a prior, we have to use a prior to describe what's going on with the entire curve. So what, we're going to use Gaussian process. So basically, our prior for x, the individual component x, y, x2, will be followed from Gaussian process. That's our, our prior for, that's our Bayesian prior to describe what the curve behave like. And in a big analysis, the next step, the fundamental step, essentially combining by your prior, um, prior distribution and together with your data and do your posterior inference, that is, infer the unknown parameter given the data you have by combining those two together. Well, but the, interesting, the difficult question here is really if you really want to attack this, attack this problem from a principled vision way, the really difficult thing is that how you construct posteriors. The reason that you encounter this difficulty is that 
is because your your Gaussian process description for X is fundamentally in conflict with the dynamic system description. The reason is because for the Gaussian process description, it, you can talk about distribution of X. You can talk about distribution of derivative of X. As long as the as long as the Gaussian kernel it has reasonable smooth property. And you can talk about conditional distribution as well. However, under the dynamic system, X is fixed. There's no such once as as soon as you know X, you know X dot. This has a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's no way for you to describe any conditional distribution of X dot given X. So that's a fundamental conflict. In the Bayesian case, you, you, because in the whole case we have three things. We have uncertainty in Y, we have uncertainty in X, we have uncertainty in X dot. If you ignore the ODE, of course you can describe any conditional distribution like. But once you put ODE constraint there, things are tricky. That's no such thing to define X star given X. That's uniquely determined. Okay? So therefore, if you really that's essentially the fundamental plot where I see people have used ad hoc variance that essentially by ignoring one system or the other system, go jumping from one system is a convenient and jumping to another system is more convenient. So that's fundamentally you have this conflict. That really really we need some difficulty, but a principle of Bayesian way is very difficult to carry out. And our idea actually took us quite a while to figure out what to do with the situation. Because in principle, these two things are incompatible with each other. How do you... Sorry, so just to clarify, so you're saying that even if you have a prior distribution on X, yes. I mean, you can infer a distribution on X dot, but it wouldn't be related by the differential equation. Would, would, wouldn't it be related to the differential equation? The differential equations of constraints under the right, under right under conditions give you a unique way, unique X. You, can, you don't have other yeah. X dot. It's uniquely determined. Yes, but it doesn't make sense to have an SDE formulation instead of the ODE. Yeah. Yeah. The, the system we're describing will, will, but under the ODE system, you you start there. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that well, now the framework later on I'll make a few comments. The framework we we uh, propose to act in principle can be applied to SDE as well, but we haven't do that extension. Well, I, I think that probably Ruth's question might be that from the combination of what <laughs> Jeremy asked that somehow you have a conditional probability for x dot given x, right? Under you don't have a specific you don't have a specific value of a conditional pro a conditional distribution for x dot given x, and you could think of that as some sort of stochastic dynamics. Maybe yeah, that's yes, what, under the Gaussian process, it's okay. Yeah, right. But okay. under ODE, it's not okay. Under ODE, there's no help because it's not giving you information. It's ODE is a deterministic. I'm sorry, and a really stupid question. I know, really stupid. Yeah. What do you mean by this priors being Gaussian processes? So you. You, you have uncertainty. A Gaussian process is a process described a continuous time process. Right. And so at any time, at any finite time point, the joint distribution is Gaussian. That's how we Okay, so Gaussian you're not process. assuming a, a delta function, so no, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. just arbitrary Gaussian, point. arbitrary Gaussian joint distribution. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So okay. the entire process of is Gaussian. In the okay, with of absolute any, continuity. Of, I mean, what what are the properties of the covariance? Gaussian the process depends on how you specify the memory kernel, the covariance mm -hmm. kernel. Right. The, you can be everywhere continuous, nowhere differentiable. Okay. You can be everywhere continuous up to whatever. So what are you assuming here? You're assuming Sorry. this whole thing follows Gaussian process. You specify the, the covariance kernel. Okay. In precise, more precise, the covariance kernel we're going to use is so-called the return covariance kernel, which has uh, tuning parameters. Okay, that's the part I wasn't sure. Okay, that's why I couldn't. No, no, yeah, that's why I couldn't understand. It's also like a Brownian motion. Okay, it is like a Brownian motion. But but your parameter is smoothing parameters. That's it. Brownian motion is not. No, no, that's what I wanted to understand. Okay, whatever. Okay, okay, that's what I understand. Okay, so so our idea is we later on realize one idea that instead of talking about free Gaussian process, what if we talk about Gaussian process? Confined on the manifold, that manifold defines the mm -hmm. system. That's intuition. Okay. So instead of working on this in, um, intractable x star given x, let's work on this. Let's work on x t given that the differential system, the, the derivatives, is specifically equal to the one specified ODE. So in other words, we're talking about confining the Gaussian process on a manifold. That manifold is controlled, deter determined by the ODE system. That's exactly what it is. That's an intuitive, that's an intuitive picture. And later I'll talk about, 
to how to put this in a more co coherent fashion is the next step. So in a nutshell, we have a prior, Gaussian process prior for the individual component x. So x has, a, let's say, capital D dimension. So we'll put one, two, three. For each dimension, we'll put Gaussian process to describe x. Our data is basically why this x with operational noise. And the constraint I mentioned, the constraint is basically the dot, the x dot has to follow the OD system. <coughs> so how do we put it into a really something workable? And one way to replace, re rewrite this is just study the soup norm. Soup norm between x dot and f. And this soup norm goes to zero, implies that x has to follow this, x has followed the OD system. So essentially, the constraint, if you run the 100% constraint, that essentially means that you require this W to be zero. Okay, therefore, put it together, our in an intuitive sense, what we really want to draw inference, we still have a Gaussian process prior, and we have a likelihood, we have operation, and what you want to do is conditionally on that W, that W being zero, and you draw inference on this conditional manifold. Conditioning on the, the process life sum is manifold, which is given by the Gaussian, which is given by the ODEs. And in, in reality, this is this is not something you can compute for in reality. That's if you want to do that, you have to use numerical solve or you defeat all purpose. Or if you, instead, what one one you what you can approximate by discrete grid. That is, you want to calculate the super norm at every point, but instead you can use the norm grid. The grid is up to you to choose. Use the grid. And you make the maximum between of the grid goes to zero. So that's a, a, a practical situ practical way that you can really do this conditionality. Therefore, so, Sam, what is your capital Y in the top? A Y is this, is this thing. Same thing. Little Y, but what's capital Y? Capital Y is random variable. Little Y is referring to your actual observation. It's like x take on value of three or something. X Ooh. little y is actually what they capital y is the determinist function of x. I should be y. I should be y. Why there? Yes. I should be right on this capital y. Okay. Yes. Little y is your actual observation. Oh, that's status and convention. Capital one referred to one variable. Yeah. Little one referring yeah. to realization. Yeah. Capital y is so so no, that I messed up. This, this should be this should be capital y. Yeah. 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 Okay. This should be capital y. Everything makes sense. So so what. So what is the role of the parameters in here? Um, the theta is all the parameters, right? Theta is the parameters. Okay, so when we take wi. Wi is this norm. Right, so the x dot. x dot is the derivative of x. Right, which. Which itself has a random variable out of the Gaussian process. Which else, under the Gaussian process prior, it is a random, random process. Okay. Okay. And as I mentioned, in reality, this is not, this, this is not workable, because this is super norm. Norms everything within all the possible range of t. Instead, we replace it by a discrete approximation, and that becomes workable in the sense that now, if you work on this, everything, what you learn in classical business statistics, in introduction business, that everything now applies applies here. You apply the base formula, you apply the posterior multiple likelihood, give you a prior multiple likelihood, give you a posterior. Everything works out, and you can write down the problem prior. But you can work on the posterior distribution in the sense that posterior distribution is prior and multiplied by the likelihood and so on. You, every step, conditionality makes sense now. Okay, so in other words, they think the, the trick is that once you replace W by WI, then everything you can carry out in a principled vision way. And I don't have to bore you with the details. And so, for example, if you break down the conditional distribution that is actually proportional to the right hand side, the proportions they cover several layers. So x, capital X goes to add little x. I suppose you have a, you're talking about realization. And that one is controlled here. That comes from your Gaussian process prior. Okay, that, this one is Gaussian memory kernel, Gaussian covariance kernel. And this step comes from the, indu once you have Gaussian process, you induce a Gaussian process on x dot. So this is referring to that induced kernel, that, that in this part. And what is this part? This part comes from observation. You have a measurement noise. This part comes from observation. So you, can, you have this part. Of course, you have normal constant. So, so that's essentially what's going on. Okay, yes. 
Do they get that right if you go from W to WI that you basically only restrict the ODE to be satisfied at the data points? No, mm -hmm. I is up to you to choose. You can specify as as dense as you like. Okay. That's up to you to control. Of course, the easiest thing to just assume the agrees with the point, but it's totally up to you. You have the computing resource, you can make it very as dense as you like. Okay, so here is the illustration. Okay, uh, what's going on here? So, so suppose, Suppose this is again in the end. This is we're trying to draw this inference. Suppose to in a con to get a con illustration, we are conditional manifold. So suppose we drop the conditionality. Suppose we drop the conditionality of W R D equal to zero. And then essentially we're talking about a Gaussian interpolator. We're using Gaussian process to interpolate the data points. Disregard O D E. Now condition this one this one level conditionality essentially pulls everything back to the manifold that defines O D E. Okay. So now we can let's, in this case we we use the Monte Carlo method to tax this problem. So we jointly consider jointly sample from theta and xi. Theta is the counter value of each of the xi are the values of calcium uh, of the x at different time points. You jointly sample from them. So this is through different through several iterations. But because we're talking about Jointly sample, you see the wind goes and you want. So essentially, as long as the chain, as the sampling converges, you'll be fluctuating around the stationary distribution. That's mm -hmm. essentially what you see here. Okay. And the original thing that you had was some like a relaxation oscillation rod was was very smooth. It was, was like this, yes. Oh, the, the initial, I'm saying, the, if you just do Gaussian fitting, you didn't get something that looks so much as. Uh, if you just do Gaussian fitting, you see this. Well, I guess it does. This, this Gaussian interpolation. Yeah, this Gaussian, Gaussian interpolation has nothing to do with OD. Okay. Once you constrain on it, you see that it gets more and more toward OD space. Okay, so so put a, put in a geometric nutshell, essentially what we are doing, put a simple picture here is that essentially by condition what as in, in matter of fact we have done conditional discrete approximation for the W. And, but if you go back to the original W equal to zero, conditioning on the sub norm being zero, and then essentially, you know, geometrically, Gaussian process goes in the entire space. But what you are trying, what we are trying to do here, you know, make it to make it in a principle way, where you essentially can condition, confine this whole thing, lie on the manifold. This manifold is defined by this holding system, defined by W equal to zero, essentially gives you this curved space, which is Manifold. And we do everything condition inference between this manifold. That is actually the idea behind everything. So in this idea, uh, we can put it in a principal vision framework, and also we can utilize a lot of vision machineries to draw a proper inference to do computation. As a matter of fact, consequently, that we can do a lot faster. First, it's a principal uh, under the principal vision framework, so all the nice properties of vision were inherited, inherited. And secondly, the computation can be really can be made fast compared with it in Microsoft, especially the system can fly. So here's a concrete illustration for again getting, uh, getting back to that FM model. And this is a demonstration of what how accurate our system can or our estimation can be and how uh, precise the quantification can be, the uncertain quantification can be. So this is the for this real <coughs> for this system we use it synthetic, synthetic data or simulation data. We, where we know the truth, A is 0.2, B is 0.2, C is equal to 3. We plug in the system, and we simulate this data, and we try to draw inference on A, B, C. So this will be our inference over repeat, repeat we, we repeat this inference once 100 times. Each time generate a new data point, and do the inference, but then we put them together. A, this is our inference of A, and together with numerical, together with standard errors from this 100 replications. So let's just see how our point estimate agrees with the prime, two prime values. So you, if you look at the plus or minus sign, that's actually very quite small compared with the system you are talking about. So you, we, we get a precise estimate. Also, the simulation was done on the different uh, observation. For example, you might have 40 observations out of the dynamic system. You might have 80 observations out of the dynamic system. You might have 120 observations out of the dynamic system. In the yeah, intuitive sense, the more operation you, you have, the more precise aspect will be. And that's indeed what's going on. And the, this next table is to numerically give a illustration how, uh, how our method do that on uh, uncertainty quantification. In other words, how, how good is your 
confidence interval compared with the real confidence interval in fact. For example, let's try to construct 95% interval estimate. And then you do the repeatedly to see how often you really can't capture the truth. And in general, we're not doing a, as accurate as 95%, but we're accurate as 83, 87% more, at least uh, most of the time. And so that's indeed indicated where we get a reasonable result. But I, at this moment, I have to tell you, this is actually the most difficult part to for all the inference methods, if you want to assess how good the unquantity uh, uh, estimation is. We, you have a lot of methods, but when they claim that the interval is very narrow, and if we repeatedly do this, they are 95% of the interval actually cover the truth only like 10% of the time. <laughs> that happens a lot because they are over and over optimistic about uncertainty quantification. Oh, you got other extreme. Well, the interval is huge. <laughs> well, the coverage is 99%, but you don't learn much about uncertainty quantification. So this is actually, this is not that difficult, but this is actually giving you good uncertainty quantification is really, I think, the difficult part of this problem. Yes? If you look at the confidence intervals, it seems that the coverage goes down, at least for B and C. Is that just by chance, or is there something more structured where you somehow, we have some kind of bias in your estimates? Bias is reflected by the point estimate. Right, but I mean, if you go to more samples, you would expect that your confidence intervals become more accurate, and it seems to be the opposite, which suggests that there could be a bias in, in the estimates. Uh, there, there, could be, there could be bias. There are several things that can introduce in introduce because we have a discrete grid. This grid actually in, in all this computation our grid is at the level 120. The quad could be like if we make the grid finer and finer we might reduce the bias. But this is for illustrative way for the also for the state computation we simply the grid is up to 120. So for example in the four degree we still use 120 as a grid that could be the question. That's actually a very good question. And so theoretically speaking, and you, there's an interesting issue that how you optimal choice your diet, uh, the, the discrete optimization, uh, discretization so that the thing become manageable. And that's actually an interesting design question we have to get checked on trust. And so in, 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 to wrap up the, this talk, my time is coming up. So we will introduce a Bayesian principle approach to address this problem of inference of OD system. But in this case, in principle, but I can do, you can do the same thing for delay differential equation system, because we don't need a dynamic system to be any parametric form, to be anything. Essentially, you, in that case, again, the, the restriction will be W equal to zero. But in this case, W will measure the discrepancy between your X dot and the delayed derivatives and so on. Okay, and the key ingredient, key inside actually take us, to be honest, this takes us two years to realize this one. We try different methods, try different methods. It's that two years to realize. In this principle, the way is to condition it on the manifold that defines the OD. That is actually the, with this approach, everything can be put on the principle of the number. Okay. And the, oh, I didn't mention the computation. Actually, a lot of computation tricks to make this calculation really fast. For example, prior temporary. The prior, you can use this. You can start from not only one Gaussian process, you can from multiple Gaussian process with the covariance flatten and flatten. You can let them to, in the beginning, you can flatten them and they down and make them <coughs> sharper and sharper and stuff. So, and you can also sample in ethics that you can let it, you can let the, dis, you can let the different uh, iterations of X go several ethics before you update your data and so on. And also you can use a plotting aspect that is, uh, you can use you, you can first go Gaussian interpolator and use that as jump start your uh, jump start your inference and so on and then visual supplementation and also in in, lot, in this calculation you have to do involve a lot of uh, involve a lot of evaluations of Gaussian memory kernel Gaussian covariance kernel and therefore if you do that matrix approximation uh, draft it can speed up the computation drastically but there's all, all those tricks to make it make it go faster but in principle. This method, this is our method. And a lot of computational tricks can make it go even faster. And a final comment is that this system can be, in principle, I only say in principle because I haven't tried it, in principle can be applied to infer SDEs as well. In SDEs, and then if you do you want to do the nonlinear non -linear least squares, this things become ch challenges because in Microsoft or not, need to solve a partial differential equation rather than just ODE. But in our case, you can still use that constraint. That constraint will be the partial derivative space, the supernorm within super of the partial derivatives goes to zero. And that can be principle applied there as well. But 
disclaimer that I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know how that applies to us. So far, for this OE system, now we try to observe an example. I didn't show another example. We can, have, we can show another example goes to after like 10 dimensions, which works quite fast. And okay, thank you very much. That's my talk. <laughs>is the approach limited to situations where you only observe the full system, or can you also handle partial observations of partial system as well. latent states? You can partial system as well. The reason is because you have, first you have Gaussian process for income together. Secondly, the, you can treat W equal to zero, really put print X1 in touch with X2. You can have a partial system as well. Okay. So this uh, constraining uh, the dynamics to the ODE is something that's used a lot in optimal control. Um, for instance, if you have a pursuit, pro a poor man's way of fitting something is to stage it as a pursuit problem where the curve, the measurements are where you're trying to get, and the noise becomes the controller, and you want to minimize that. And then they always condition on the ODE, typically by putting in Lagrange multiplier or so forth. Um, is that similar to what you're doing? Or? Well, in certain sense, it's yes. In certain sense, it's no. In certain sense, oh, this always would replace, would be regular regularization. You regularize the whole optimization under the Gaussian manifold. That's one way to do this. And Bayesian way is like our prior, Bayesian prior, especially Bayesian condition analogy, that in certain sense corresponds to the regularization in optimization literature. So that has this correspondence. But they, uh, they were not doing op any optimization in this case. The approach is through sampling approach. Okay. Yeah. But essentially that one, you can interpret it from the regularization perspective. Sure. Yeah, I mean, what I was describing before is not at all a Bayesian approach. Yes. But it still does that, have that you know, restriction to the you know, yes. dynamic. So, for example, oh, that's a long story. That a lot of the current popular regularization methods can interpret from a Bayesian proprietary perspective. For example, all the L1 penalization, you can imagine you put the plus prior on the beta. Then the posteriors will be posterior mode will pre precisely the L1 penalization and so on. That's a, but the beta is, goes beyond the posterior mode, it goes in higher distribution. Yep. So we've used um, Gaussian process to estimate derivatives before, and one issue we had um, <coughs> is hyperparameters. How do you handle that? Yes, yeah, so the Gaussian process, as a matter of fact, the Gaussian process itself has has a memory kernel, that's the important thing. And mean function is rather not sensitive, but memory kernel is quite sensitive. So for example, you can exactly you can define according you can define memory kernel so that you have you would require the degree of smoothness. And in our case we use the merchant family and in particular we fix the smoothness degree to be something like two point five or something. <laughs> We didn't do it. So otherwise. you're not doing extra. We're, we're, we're not doing estimation for that smoothness, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but we have extra parameters for the scale. For the memory kernel, you can specify the scale. And that's something we also estimate the amount of So, um, so the delay differential equations are infinite dimension. I mean, yes. So, how is that? So, but in this pro so, so how are you dealing with that in this process? So, it's through the time discretization? Through this. Through this. Through this definition. So through, you, through the discretization of the initial conditions. The, the, the discretization of this whole thing. I mean, in principle, you want to make everything over all the range of t. But in practicality, you discretize it and use a discrete approximation for that. And by as long as you do discretization, everything can, put, can, can be put in the principle of radio So everything comes from. Do you have memory issues with that because you have to keep track of the whole history over the lag period, right? If you do the delay. Just the previous. For the, for the delay, if, if you want to use the, the numerical solvers, then you have to track everything. Right. Otherwise, the numerical solver will not be able to do it. But in our case, we only need to record it because we're using Gaussian process. So it's we only need, to, need to record the thing as a few discrete points actually given by your eye. <laughs> How big is eye? When you, the you guys, in the real sample, up to minus 20 points. I have a quick question. So when you sample, it looks like the, the samples are, don't come, you know, they have little wiggles, so they don't look like the solution, it's just the effect of discretization, or? The, the, the sample, so this is jointly sample of theta and x together, therefore x has its own wiggle around. And so basically, think about this, you sample, not only think sample ABCs, but also you sample X at, at capital I or at all the points. 
you join join this sample together. So to right, make but it, but if they're restricted to the ODE manifold, right? If you, if you're but you have the, you, because you you're because the at a discrete time time. Okay. If you make it I yeah, 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 one thousand yeah. or something, you'll yeah, see that really yeah, yeah. smooth. Okay. Just changing the Gaussian prior. I'm sorry. Just changing the the memory kernel of the Gaussian prior smooth that up. No, because then, because the dense make it smooth out. The dense not, because the state also changes the bit. Because I have to yeah, see that yeah. some of the change. Yeah. Right, so here, thanks, both speakers. Uh, we'll come back at ten to eleven. <laughs> Wait a little bit. <laughs>